The main threat presented to us in Lords of the Fallen is that of Adir and his imminent return. Yet underlying this story is a more insidious threat, an eye that is always watching, always hungering, with the power to devour even gods, and one can't help but wonder whether the uncaring Aureus or cruel Adir would be preferable to letting this power take control. I of course refer to Umbral, a realm of suffering, a parasitic dimension that acts as a shadow to the world of Axiom, and at its heart sits the putrid mother, a god, a being that even Adir fears. Though the average human may remain blissfully ignorant of its presence, those in the know are aware that Umbral is everywhere, surrounding Axiom like a moth to a flame, separated only by a thin veil. In their desperation to stop the threat of Adir, the Dark Crusaders of the Orion Church have began to utilise its dreadful power by unleashing the Umbral Lanterns. But in doing so, they may hasten the destruction of this world, for the putrid mother desires nothing less than the shattering of the veil so that she may devour everything in reality. The lore of Umbral is one of the central pillars of Lords of the Fallen, so in this lore video we will go deep into the subject, analysing what Umbral is, what the putrid mother wants, as well as the Umbral ending to the game. I've also been lucky enough to have contact with two of the devs from Hexworks, and so I will be able to give you lore insights from the team themselves. But before we get started, if you like lore videos, then consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel, because that's what we do here. However, before we dive any further into the world of Umbral, here are a few words from today's sponsor, Raycon. As we approach the Christmas season, I imagine there's always that one family member who is tough to buy for. Raycon's range of high quality products offer something for everyone, from granny to brother. Raycon are well known for premium audio, with products like these everyday earbuds, which are compact, sleek, with incredible sound quality. With 32 hours of battery and passive noise isolation, they are absolutely perfect for my late night walks in Edinburgh while I blast Age of Empires 2 soundtrack. I absolutely love the everyday earbuds, they are the most comfortable and snug earphones I've ever had, fitting the ear perfectly with sound quality to match and then I just pop them in their convenient little case when I'm done. If the smaller buds aren't for you, then Raycon still has you covered with classic headphones or their PowerTech line, with great gift ideas like the faucet filter and air purifiers. All great products at an inexpensive price point. With thousands of 5 star reviews across all products, now is a great time to fill up your stockings. This holiday season get premium sound at a great price, and save even more doing it. Go to buyraycon.com slash smotown to get 15% off site wide. Thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring this video, and now back to the lore. At the onset of this video, I think it's worth us discussing the fundamentals of Umbral, what it is and where it comes from. The first clue is of course in the name itself, Umbral, with Umbra essentially meaning a shadow, which makes sense of course given that it acts like a shadow to Axiom, intangible but always present, a dark reflection to the bright world of Axiom. While most do not see Umbral or even sense it, it is clear that Umbral is acutely aware of Axiom, forming around it like a hungry parasite. Indeed, one can even see Umbral denizens forming around beacons, literally moths to a flame. And as an aside, this is why I think moth imagery is very much prominent within Umbral, because it acts like a moth to a flame, as Umbral is drawn to Axiom's abundant source of food. Umbral moths also seem to be the messengers or envoys of Umbral, able to cross the barrier more freely between the two worlds, unlike the other elements of Umbral. The moth ring reads as follows. The presence of Umbral is sometimes signalled by the accompanying presence of Umbral moths, ephemeral, intangible creatures which flutter between realities, their origins and exact nature unclear. When you summon an NPC to help you with a boss, their outline is marked by Umbral moths. The trophy for Isaac's storyline describes his summon as an Umbral imprint, the moment when you summon him to fight against the Light Reaper in Calrath. So it seems as though summons are umbral memories or imprints of the real characters, 
given passage from Umbral via the Moths to help the Lamp Bearer. We are likely given this ability to summon these Umbral imprints because of our connection to Umbral via the Lamp. Likewise, when we die, we reform as a cloud of Moths, again suggesting that the Moths serve as cycle pumps or guides of Umbral, guiding our soul and body to reform in Umbral after death. The all-encompassing nature of Umbral is well represented by the description of the Umbral Vertebrae, which reads as follows. From the lowliest insect to the mightiest god, whatever the being, if it lives, then it does so in the shadow of Umbral. Wherever there is life, there is Umbral. As it seeks out living things for nourishment, it always hungers for it. Indeed, this is the case across all realities. And this is something we learn of via the Crushing Gaze, which reads the following. The being known to some as the Crafter had visited countless realities and learnt there were precious few constants across existence, and he took no joy in the fact that the Putrid Mother was one of them. To explain a little, the Crafter that has been referred to here is Sparky. The Crafter was a mysterious character in Lords of the Fallen One, an interdimensional traveller and a smith, who assisted Harkin in his fight against the Rogar. You can see the similarity between the two models, albeit Sparky has clearly fallen on some bad times being imprisoned by Gerlinda. I also like that they tease his true identity when he almost introduces himself to the lamp bearer by name, but Gerlinda interrupts him before he can say his real name. The fact that he is the crafter from the first game is reinforced when he tells us that he knows of Harkin, the Iron Wayfarer. Like you. Rhodes, Lord Sted, Traveller, a man I encountered long ago, one already burdened then, a burden which has only increased enormously in the years since, and taken a heavy toll, had prolonged exposure to that obscure force so baneful to humanity, and his is a bleak, ruinous road. Either way, we know that this crafter, Sparky, was able to travel to different dimensions, and it is frightening to know that Umbral shadows every single reality. Umbral is a constant, just as death is. The idea of this realm being a mirror or a shadow was an idea that was shared with me by Cesar, the creative director of Hexworks who I got to interview in July, and he called it a dark mirror. And this is why Umbral has strong echoes of emotion of things that happen in Axiom, the memory sequences we can unlock called Umbral Stigmas. These are moments of great stress or emotion that have been captured or imprinted upon the Umbral Realm, again acting as a shadow to Axiom. But it is worth noting that Umbral clearly feeds off of these great emotions or these moments in history, as when we activate the Umbral Stigmas, we receive an item called the Umbral Scouring, that clearly looks like a parasite. A parasite that is embedded and feeding upon this memory. The idea of strong emotions manifesting or imprinting upon Umbral is further illustrated by the enemies that we fight in Umbral, the Husks, the Moths, and the Mendacious Visages. None of these enemies are true living beings, and Chazar explained them in the following way when I interviewed him. That is why the husks in Umbral that aren't alive, they aren't even real. They are figments of your imagination. That's why you see illusions and then they materialise. They don't have faces because they are emotions, such as unfulfilled motherhood. They are all unfulfilled feelings. For Warhammer fans, this is somewhat like the warp, an immaterial realm that forms its own beings and consciousness from the emotions and actions of the mortal races, of the material realm, and to reinforce the idea that these umbral beings aren't alive and are just manifestations, note that you cannot soul flay them. If you use soul flay on one of these beings, it just throws them around. They don't have a soul because they aren't alive. This is clearly relevant for all the umbral enemies that we encounter, like the moths. The set that these enemies drop is called the despair set and the Despair's Cocoon, the chess piece, reads the following. A pale shell imprinted with hands. Are they protecting something? Or clutching for that which was lost? So this is what Chazar was obviously referring to. These moths are clearly manifestations of unfulfilled motherhood. 
whether that was not having a child in the first place or losing a child. And we can see this in their design, they have somewhat pregnant bellies and they do seem to have hands clasping at that belly. And as such, they are the manifestations of the despair associated with losing a child. Likewise, we can apply this to other creatures found in Umbral, like the Mendacious Visage. This could well represent lying, as Mendacious means liar or deceit. And indeed, the visage does hide its true face behind its outer fake one. And so already, by just looking at the enemies found in Umbral, we find that Umbral, to its very core, is parasitic by nature. Everything it takes, it takes from Axiom and the material world, even the forms of its denizens, all things that are formed and feed off emotions from the real material Axiom. A really good illustration of Axiom imprinting upon Umbral is found in the Fief of the Chill Curse. In this area in particular, you will notice that if you go into the Umbral Realm, you will notice there are a lot of crow-like shapes, and this is unusual because you don't see these crows elsewhere. But there is a reason for it, specific to this area, that becomes abundantly clear when we meet the Hollow Crow, a creature born of grief and a failed ritual. But we will talk more on that shortly. Another interesting example of Umbral imprints is at the Abbey, where we can see these Umbral formations that take the shape of a moth human that looks very much like Elaine the Starve. Now we know that Pieta spent a large part of her life here. The Abbey is the only home I've ever known besides the orphanage. It pains me to see it now. As it does to see my afflicted brothers and sisters who roam its halls and courts. And so I take these umbral reflections to be the result of Elaine living here, where the umbral realm saw her true face. This property of imprinting is actually how we are able to use the remembrances of bosses to recreate weapons or other abilities. We do this through the use of an item called the Bowl of Revelations, an item which we must give to Molhu. And its description tells us it is a bowl of Nuhuta origin. Molhu is the last of the Nuhuta, a race of subterranean umbral worshippers, who we will discuss later. But given we gather these remembrances from umbral stigmas, and then we use a bowl created by an umbral worshipping race, it is clear that Umbral is responsible for these remembrances and being able to convert them into weapons. However, there is more to Umbral than just feeding on strong emotions. It is also essentially the realm of the dead, a realm that feeds on the death of mortals. We learn how important death is to Umbral via the Ring of Night's Fire, which reads the following. For some, rather than being a release from pain, death is instead a gateway to the fresh torments of Umbral. The implication being that if one dies, you can end up being trapped or drawn into Umbral, this realm of the dead. The very fact that we are able to resurrect, to be a sort of immortal revenant, because of the Umbral Lamp, emphasises the relationship that Umbral has with life and death. And indeed, the Helvet Rune says that the Umbral Lamps are objects with powerful connections to both life and death, granting immortality to their bearers. Yet, Umbral's connection to death is not rooted in the fact that it serves as a traditional underworld in a cosmic system of balance, like Hades does to the Greek pantheon. No, as we have discussed, Umbral and the Putrid Mother are essentially a giant parasite, and thus death is a convenient way for them to feed. This is why Umbral is so prevalent in areas where there has been a lot of death, feasting upon the fresh source of souls. Like in the Fief of the Chill Curse, where an entire populace was wiped out in an instant. A story that we will return to later, but you can see that this is an area heavily affected by Umbral, and there is a reason for it, because a lot of death has happened here. With this in mind, I find the Nohuta writings found in the description of the Livid Hatred Colour Tint to be of particular interest. It reads as following. Festering ire can be found at the heart of many momentous acts of war, bringing death on a wondrous scale, for which we must be thankful, while never forgetting that hatred can also be a tool employed against us by unbelievers. Again, the Nohuta are a race of umbral worshipping creatures, and thus to them, sources of great death, like war, are something to rejoice in, because it's something the Putrid Mother and the Umbral Realm can feast upon. 
The Putrid Mother is essentially a giant parasite or scavenger, and while Axiom and its life is protected from her hunger by a veil, the souls of the dead can be absorbed by Umbral through the veil. We can see how this works through our own character, who is wielding the Umbral Lamp, and as such we are intimately connected to the Umbral Realm, and we too become a sort of parasite, as we feed off the vigour of others and become stronger. We are able to see and pick up the vigour of fallen enemies, and the fact that this item is purple makes it clear that it is the power of Umbral that allows us to absorb the life essences of other. Indeed, if we use our lamp we can pull in vigour from the surrounding area. Likewise, we can assume that Umbral pulls in the spirit or essence of those who have died, and so it reinforces the idea that Umbral's relationship to death is parasitic, just a means through which the putrid mother can absorb mortals into Umbral. Bear in mind, the lamp is also able to soul flee, leeching or drawing out a being's essence, again perhaps a microcosm of the larger effect of Umbral, leeching the essence of those who die into this Umbral realm from Axiom. Indeed, I believe the Umbral Lamp is a good way for us to examine the power of the Putrid Mother herself. The Lamp is clearly a way in which the power of Umbral can be brought to bear in the Axiom realm, a trapped piece of Umbral energy. With this lamp we are able to rip out the souls of our enemies, draw in their vigour, and even consume an entire god if you follow the Aureus ending. If this represents a fraction of the Putrid Mother's consumptive power, then we can only imagine how truly powerful she is, how overwhelming and absolute her power to consume is, and this is why Adir fears her soul. It doesn't matter whether Umbral is consuming a human or a god, it will consume them nonetheless. Which is of course why it's so effective at cleansing the beacons, it is consuming the corruption of Adir found within these beacons. As it is, the Putrid Mother is separated from the living and Axiom by a veil, and for now, the Umbral Lamp is the only locus for her power in the living world, and the Putrid Mother must satisfy herself on the souls of the dead. Finally, Umbral's association with death and poison is further reinforced by the fact that its effects are often utilised by assassins. The Pestilent Blade reads the following. Some of the most fearsome assassins of all time have been Umbral adherents, carrying out their killings not only as a trade, but as a means of worship. Hence a lot of Umbral's energies and magics revolve around death, putrefaction, withering and poison, and the purpose of this is explained to us by the Pendant of Atrophy, which reads, Umbral magic can be devastatingly injurious to mortal flesh, its fundamental purpose being to impel a being's essence from Axiom to the Umbral realm. Death allows Umbral to absorb essences from Axiom, and this is why a lot of symbolism associated with Umbral is associated with death, poison and atrophy. Hence the armour set you get through the Umbral Shrine by offering plucked eyeballs is that of a skeleton, and the Angel of the Void set, the armour set of an Umbral culture, is that of a skeleton as well. Poison's association with Umbral is pretty straightforward. Given Umbral wants to spread death in order to feed more, poison is a great way of spreading said death, and we do find poison in areas associated with Umbral, such as the Forsaken Fen and the Mines. Not only this, enemies like the Moths do give off poison attacks, the putrefaction or the atrophying part of Umbral is also represented by certain enemies, namely the maggot phantoms that the Mendacious Visage gives out. And Umbral's close association with death is also reinforced by its connection to another element, frost or cold, and we learn of this connection by a frost arrows which reads, Some in Axiom who experience the influence of Umbral feel a deep gnawing cold as part of it, a primal chill both hollow and hopeless. As we will see when we look at the Thief of the Chill Curse, Umbral is certainly prone to manifesting in Axiom as Frost. This of course is just classic symbolism, as life is often associated with heat and warmth, and death is often associated with chill. If Umbral feeds off both emotion and death, it is little wonder that beings like the Light Reaper and Harkin are host to such powerful parasites fatted off a lifetime of pain and suffering, 
And in my mind, this is why the eye is such a prevalent symbol of the Umbral Realm and the Putrid Mother. Because they are hungry, envious eyes. They are always watching the world of the living that she so craves. For example, Geoffrey's dagger reads, Although the fact is far more apparent and maddening, while in the Umbral Realm, those with enough Umbral knowledge know that whatever the realm, the Putrid Mother is always watching. This is why one can see a giant eye in place of the moon in Umbral. The Putrid Mother is always watching the Axiom Realm, we just can't see it most of the time. Umbral is a different reality that lies alongside Axiom, feeding on it like a parasite and hungering to possess the waking world permanently. This is why Umbral's taint is not visible in the mundane world except for a few areas where the veil is partially thin. Only those in tune with Umbral or in possession of a lamp will understand that Umbral is always present. As we will discuss in the closing parts of this video, I believe the Putrid Mother's aim and the Umbral ending of this game is to increase her influence in Axiom to create a bridge through which she can cross and descend upon Axiom. Her parasites are the main way of doing so, umbral beings that have feasted on individuals that exist partially in Axiom and partially in Umbral. Bridges themselves, like Harkin the Lamp Bearer, but more on that later. You would be forgiven for thinking that Adir is the oldest being in existence. After all, he is the creator of mankind. However, the description of the Pale Eye Shield suggests that Umbral has long existed, perhaps forever, as it reads, whether it was some primitive human ancestor, or a different being entirely, who painted the symbols which adorn this shield is debatable, although it is a certainty that Umbral was already extant long before mankind ever set foot in Axiom. This item description suggests that Umbral existed long before humans were even a thing. Does this mean that the Putrid Mother even predates a deer? I think ultimately such cosmic questions are beyond us with the limited lore that we have in the game at the moment, but suffice it to say that Umbral has existed for a long time and is a constant across all realities. As for the Putrid Mother herself, what is she? Is she formed of Umbral, or is Umbral formed of her? Again this is purely speculation, but we can consider her the god of this dimension, and I believe that her and Umbral are one. Umbral is an extension of her will and her hunger. She is the sentience at the heart of this parasitic realm. And for as long as Umbral has existed, so has she. To surmise, Umbral is a realm separate from Axiom that is ruled over by the Putrid Mother. It is a parasite, a hungry shadow that has coiled itself around the realm of the living, wishing to devour everything within. The only thing true to Umbral is hunger. The rest is immaterial and any being found within Umbral is likely just a reflection of Axiom, such as the nature of a parasite. And while Umbral thematically takes on the role of the realm of the dead, it doesn't hold that position as part of cosmic balance. It is a hungry beast, and death is merely a means to satiate that hunger. Only a thin veil separates the two realms, and as such, the Umbral realm feeds on the strong emotions and the dead of Axiom. With that said, Umbral is not without its followers or devotees, and so in this next chapter we will discuss the history of Umbral worship in Axiom. In the current time period of Lords of the Fallen, it may appear that there is no evidence of Umbral worship, and it is certainly clear that the worship of Aureus and even Adir are more prevalent, but there are plenty of those who are interested in Umbral. There are Umbral scholars, like Geoffrey, someone we can witness being imprisoned in the Tower of Penance by the Orion faithful thanks to an Umbral stigma, and the mysterious Lan Gerish, whose quotes we can find in numerous items associated with Umbral, and there are those who are interested in a less scholarly way that worship Umbral, and the description of the colour tinct Umbral blue makes reference to the surreptitious worship of Umbral that takes place not just in Mornstead, but across Axiom as a whole. As it states, Across Axiom there exist like-minded groups of beings who have found purpose in Umbral, and in dank cellars, abandoned ruins, shadowy backrooms they gather, breath steaming in the numbing chill, which often accompanies spaces where the presence of Umbral looms keenly. 
And again, we get a nice illustration that cold often accompanies the presence of Umbral. But this description paints a cult-like picture of the worship of Umbral, and it certainly makes sense given that Aureus is the dominant religion in the current era, and this is somewhat analogous to Catholicism or Christianity as a whole. And thus Umbral worship would most likely be seen as pagan worship, where Adir would be the worship of the devil. But with that said, there is an interesting history of Umbral worship in Axiom. For example, the most Umbral affected area in the game is the Mines and Revelation Depths, a region where Umbral does actually spill over into the real world, and it is where the entrance to Mother's Lull ultimately lies. This entrance is found in a temple that itself is designed after a skull, and it has a sort of primitive look to it. And in another place within the Revelation Depths, there is another primitive looking shrine which I take to be dedicated to the Putrid Mother. Is this perhaps evidence of a primitive cave dwelling human society, who being closer to Umbral given they are in the depths where the veil is thinner, worship the Putrid Mother rather than Adir? This is definitely possible, however there is another subterranean community who is more likely to have built this temple, the Nuhuta, the race to which Molhu belongs. The Umbral Lamp description tells us not only that this item is an object of Nuhuta invention, but also that Molhu is the last of their kind, and we can learn a little bit about these beings from the Nuhuta Polearm, which reads the following. There was little infighting amongst the Nuhuta throughout most of their history. The species almost always completely united in their utter devotion to the Putrid Mother, although weapons were still necessary in dealing with the occasional external threats. This was a species more or less completely devoted to the Putrid Mother, and as we can see they are very inhuman in their appearance. Molhu is sitting down most of the time, but in reality these beings stand far taller than a man, and have six arms, and some of these palms have eyes on it. Now it is unclear whether some of these physiological elements are natural to their kind, and that they were always sensitive to Umbral, or whether these are mutations due to a prolonged exposure to Umbral. I probably land somewhere in between, where I believe that the Nohuta do have an increased sensitivity to Umbral, but the likes of the eyes in their hands are mutations brought about by their close exposure to Umbral. Now, we know these beings lived underground thanks to the item that also tells us about their genocide, the Putrid Polearm, which reads the following. When the hallowed sentinels carried out the genocide of the Nuhuta, they explored little of the subterranean labyrinth they encountered, instead sealing off a place they deemed cursed and of the utmost heresy. So these beings lived in a subterranean labyrinth, and of course that makes sense given that we have already mentioned Umbral has a strong connection to the deep places of the earth. As to where this labyrinth was literally located, it is hard to tell, especially since the hallowed sentinels have sealed it off, but I can speculate a little on it. One potential location is below the Temple of Mother's Lull. As you might notice, there is some kind of door underneath the central shrine that does look to have been sealed. I do find this interesting because it is the hallowed sentinels who used the boy as a bulwark against Umbral, again a story that we will return to shortly. Thus it could be that they sealed this entrance at around the same time that they used the boy to seal Umbral in general. I do think the Nohuta are most likely the creators of the temple found in Revelation Depths, and thus it would make sense that the labyrinth they are from is also connected to this place. The fact that their slaves, the Shuja, settled down in the Forsaken Fen really suggests that the Nohuta civilization must have been nearby, and the Revelation Depths do match that parameter. Apart from this, I'm very much an Occam's Razor guy when it comes to speculation, and this would dictate that the Nohuta would be located somewhere in the vicinity of Revelation Depths, the place where the connection to Umbral is the strongest. So they were pretty united in their worship of the Putrid Mother, and thus it is no surprise that these beings created tools such as the Umbral Lamp, and the Nohuta Ritual Hammer tells us of the religion and rites they created, as it reads, The Nohuta employed all manner of tools and practices in their various rituals honouring Umbral and the Putrid Mother, their religion having developed in seclusion over eons. This is interesting in many ways. The Nohuta worship the Putrid Mother as a god, and they are a very old society, 
having developed over eons. There is a brutal aspect to this society, as is suggested by the fact they even have a ritual hammer, which is to be expected given they are worshipping a hungry, devouring death god. We learn of some of the grim rituals the Nahuta would partake in via the description of the Qualis rune, which reads, Despite the horrific nature of some of the rituals performed by the Nahuta in honour of the Putrid Mother to the subterranean beings, they were acts of odd joy and divine celebration. This of course implies sacrifices of a certain brutality, and the brutality does not end there as they were enslavers. The race they enslaved were known as the Shuja, a fact we learn from the Shuja Harmony Loop which reads the following. While the Shuja exhibit their own culture, one cultivated since their emancipation from the Nahuta, little effort has been made to study it due to the Shuja's hostility towards any who trespass upon their land. The Shuja are the tribalistic creatures we find in the Forsaken Fen, an area that is also significant to Umbral. And the Shuja in time would develop their own brutal religion, and it is hard not to see them inheriting this from their Nahuta masters, but we will return to the Shuja in a later chapter. The Nahuta's relationship with the Putrid Mother and their religion in her name clearly allowed them to gain some keen insights into the nature of Umbral, as is evidenced through their writings. For example, there is this quote which belays the Nahuta's knowledge of the Putrid Mother's connection to death, and this is from the colour-tinked Rotting Glory, and it reads, the ignorant living cling to the ephemeral, insisting that what they deem of importance will not wither, die, and be forgotten, unwilling to accept the everlasting peace known by the fortunate dead upon whose dust they tread. Of course, little now remains of this culture, as the Nohuta polearm tells us of their slaughter at the hands of the hallowed sentinels, who no doubt saw the Nohuta and their practices as pagan and heretical. Indeed, even now, people still see the Umbral Lamp as heretical, if necessary. And so, Molhu became the last of their kind, yet their legacy is far from over, especially if we choose to walk the Umbral Path, as they created the lamps and they most likely created the Mother's Temple. And it is Molhu who guides us on our path to help the Putrid Mother gain her ascension, but again we will return to that later. Yet human worship of Umbral was also prevalent in Mornstead at a certain time, and this is something we can learn via Umbral Weapon, which reads, Fearing further persecution even after their exile from Calrath, the outcasts who settled in Forsaken Fen created the role of a guardian, the Angel of the Void, to watch over them, the role being occupied over the years by a succession of their greatest warriors. So here we begin to learn the interesting story of the Forsaken Fen, and that it wasn't always occupied by the Shuja, and indeed was occupied by umbral worshipping exiles from Kalrath. This group clearly had their own culture and beliefs. The Angel of the Void became their protector, a symbolic warrior, the Void of course being this group's interpretation of umbral. Also given that this is a position held by a number of heroes over successive generations, we can assume that this culture existed for a while. Indeed, I feel as though we can see some remnants of this society, as among the tribal structures of the Shuja are many stone ruins. These buildings are clearly more complex and are not of Shuja origin or construction, and have long fallen to ruin, so it makes sense that these belong to this lost community. Indeed, some of the statues found in the Forsaken Fen of this ruined community are pretty unsettling, and perhaps somehow represent their umbral faith, or they represent the Putrid Mother herself, and it's their interpretation of an umbral religion. These constructions are quite advanced, and it really gets my imagination going about how this culture really developed in the years following their exile from Kalrath, and I wish we knew more about them. Sadly, ruins are all that remain of this umbral outcast community, and we learn about the cataclysm that wiped them out via the Poison Cure item description, which reads the following. The cause behind the sudden cataclysm which wiped out the umbral worshipping outcasts of the Forsaken Fen was never determined by the citizens of Kalrath, but whatever the truth, most considered it a self-inflicted and deserved doom brought about by profane practices. So some sudden event led to the wipeout and disappearance of these people, 
And my interpretation is, is that the members of this Umbral Outcast community took part in some Umbral ritual that ultimately resulted in their demise. As we do see something similar in the Thief of the Chill Curse, which we will get to shortly. And much as the Thief is now afflicted by an abundance of frost and snow, the Forsaken Fen is afflicted by poison swamps, a telltale sign of Umbral's influence, given what we've already discussed regarding poison and Umbral. Surely no human community would choose to settle in an area that is actually a poison swamp. I certainly don't believe so, and I believe the poison swamp is a result of what these Umbral worshippers did that led to their demise. Umbral is very heavy in this area, as we see from the Rising Dead and the Rising Harsh Saint, who again we will discuss momentarily. But in short, I believe the Forsaken Fen is very much afflicted by the power of Umbral thanks to these lost humans, and thus it makes it more interesting that the Shuja chose this place to settle given that they were once ruled over by an Umbral society, as if they were attracted to the Umbral Salt Realm of Forsaken Fen without really knowing it. But it is to the Shuja and the Hush Saint that we turn to in the next chapter. We've already discussed the fact that the Shuja Harmony Loop describes that the Shuja developed their own new culture once they were emancipated from the Nahuta, and they came to settle in the Forsaken Fen. Indeed, we see evidence of their own culture via their shrines, totems, fearsome masks and warrior culture, and an effigy that dominates the centre of their town. And more interestingly, they have a penchant for taking heads. We learn of this via Tekir, who says the following after trying to approach the Shuja as customers. But uh, they seem quite focused on heads, including the removal of them. So, I thought it best to keep my distance. Indeed, we can find many a head on pikes around their settlement, and this rather violent practice very much explains why they are so deadly. If you require heads, then you will likely need to take them by force, which is why the Shuja have such a fearsome warrior culture. Their reputation as warriors has led to hallowed sentinels and rogar giving them a wide berth, as the Shuja warrior spear reads, Spear of a Shuja warrior. After several unsuccessful expeditions deep into Forsaken Fen at the cost of numerous lives, both Hallowed Sentinels and Rogar were forced to recognise the lethal mastery the Shuja exhibited over their native habitat. So yes, they are widely feared, and indeed this is the only area in the entire map of Mornstead that you don't face human or Rogar enemies, and that is a testament to the fearsome Shuja warrior culture. But why do they have this focus on taking heads? Well, the evidence is found in the other enemy type of this area, the Headless Poison Zombies, also known as the Fetid Sacrifices. Now, given the headless nature, we can assume that these are the discarded sacrifices, and indeed, this is confirmed from the garments that they drop, the Fetid Sacrifice set that reads the following. Some victims of the Shuja headhunters now aimlessly roam Forsaken Fen, finding little peace in death and even less comfort in their forced offerings to the Hushed Saint. The Shuja's worship of the Hushed Saint is very interesting, and it suddenly makes a sense of a lot of their lore, not least the giant burning effigy in the centre of their town, which is so clearly modelled after their new god, Note the distinctive upturned crescent you can see at the top of the effigy, that is so clearly modelled on the unique armour of the Hushed Saint. We do actually know a fair bit about the Hushed Saint, as his armour set tells us how he was interred here in the beacon of Forsaken Fen. His armour reads, Few sentinels have been elevated to sainthood, and Saint Latimer remains one of the most revered. The text written since his death describing both his unfailing loyalty to the cleric and his eventual self-sacrifice, giving his life to prove what was necessary for the greater good. So Latimer was once a hallowed sentinel, and one who sacrificed himself and thus became a saint, a martyr of this religion. Indeed, we even witnessed this event through an umbral stigma, the moment he was interred by Judge Cleric and the hallowed sentinels. Dedication to our cause be remembered evermore. 
This moment and his canonization is an important moment in their religion, as we see the Sacrifice of St. Latimer scenes on friezes throughout buildings that are associated with the Hallowed Sentinels. A scene depicting him kneeling before the Judge Cleric, with the Forsaken Fen tree in the background. But there is an important detail here that I think many will miss. Latimer's head is the artifact that is used for this sacrifice. This is why the hushed Saint Boss is headless when we fight it, with a root growing where his head would be, and this is why he is hushed. He has no head to speak with. If you look closely at the Umbral Memory, you can see that Judge Cleric is carrying his head specifically, and if you look into the beacon itself, you can see a very toothy head, and thus his headless body and horse must have been buried in the area, as it was only the head that was used for the beacon. This is common between all of the beacons, if you didn't realise. Each of them has a human sacrifice at the centre, all in various forms. Latimer's sacrifice was a willing one, where he offered himself up for the role, which is why it's an important moment for the Hallowed Sentinels. In a dialogue, Pieta also confirms that Latimer's sacrifice and beacon was the first, which explains why it was so ceremonial in nature and became canonised. It was a great way for the Hallowed Sentinels to beautify and idealise what essentially amounts to human sacrifice. Yet others clearly were not as willing, for example, the Tower of Penance Beacon, which features a prisoner in a torture device as the centerpiece for the beacon. This leads us to conclude that a human sacrifice is necessary for a beacon to be made, and there are some sinister implications here that we will explore in a later video. Make your cups, but returning to Latimer, it is clear that while his head was used as the material for the beacon, his body must have been buried in the area as well, as this is what we fight as a boss. And thanks to his sacrifice, the first beacon went up, helping a deer stay imprisoned, and he became canonised as Saint Latimer. And I imagine this all took place long before the Shuja lived here, and even before the Umbral worshippers lived here. After all, I imagine Judge Cleric would have wiped out either culture, both being heretical, had they lived in a location she had chosen for a beacon. However, Latimer's corpse would not rest easy. We have already discussed the effect that the Umbral Outcasts had on this area thanks to their Umbral practices, and in Latimer's arena, you can see a large amount of Umbral Parasites if you go into the Umbral Realm. We learn of the effect that the Umbral had on Latimer's remains thanks to the description of Latimer's Javelin, which reads the following. While not naturally adept in sorcery, Latimer preserved in his learning some basic radiant spells, simply so he might better aid the comrades who fought alongside him in battle. However, as his remains mouldered in Forsaken Fen, the magic he had learnt took on a fouler, darker aspect. The darker aspect is of course Umbral, and this is why Latimer's corpse is able to rise from the dead. Latimer's javelin itself, from which we just read the description, is an Umbral spell, which reinforces the fact that the magic that affected Latimer's body as he was buried here was indeed Umbral, and the Hushed Saint is essentially a Umbral Revenant. Indeed, it is also why the Fetid Sacrifices are able to rise from the poison swamps despite having their heads chopped off. This is a land sodden with the power of Umbral, and Umbral is the only magic that we know of that can raise things from the dead. Aside from that, you will note that the Hushed Saint actually does cold damage, an element very much associated with Umbral. The Fetid Sacrifices and Hushed Saint also look the same, both having gnarled roots growing over their remains, reinforcing the idea that they have been animated by the same phenomena. When I first fought the Hushed Saint, I believed that he was animated by some hallowed sentinel magic, and that he was created this way to be a guardian but it is clear that because the fetid sacrifices in this area are animated and look the very same as the Hushed Saint, that it's the umbral effect of this area that have allowed Latimer's remains to rise from the dead once more as the Hushed Saint that is now worshipped by the Shuja. And Latimer's sacrifice on behalf of the Hallowed Sentinels merely amounted to him sacrificing his body to become the source of the beacon in this area. The Shuja in this area must have witnessed the Hush Saint rising from his grave, and that is why they worship him as their new god. He is headless, 
so of course they offer him heads, and they raise a great burning effigy in his honour. I find this whole subplot very interesting, as the whole Forsaken Fen is an area that has been distinctly affected by the presence of Umbral, leading to a whole new culture and religion developing around it. It's why I find the following description from the warrior arm wrappings of the Shuja to be very interesting, as it reads, Finally unfettered after eons of slavery, the Shuja came into the light as free beings, only to ultimately trade one form of subjugation for another. So they had spent eons enslaved to an umbral worshipping race, only to end up worshipping an umbral revenant. One form of subjugation traded for another. Umbral has a strong presence in Mornstead, and this is a fact that is not known to many. The Pendant of Parting reads, The presence of Umbral has always been potent in Mornstead, the kingdom unwittingly built upon a place where the veil between realms can be particularly thin. This thin veil is of course in the Temple of Mother's Lull that we have discussed previously, and it is why the mines built atop these ruins and on top of Revelation Depths is an area heavily afflicted by Umbral as well. These mines were important to Mornstead's prosperity, and this was something told to me by Cesar Vertuzzo, the creative director, and he said the following. This is high level stuff, so yeah, the Kingdom of Mornstead was a very successful, industrious place with a mine. Is it a deer who speaks from the bowels of the earth? You don't know. There's a lot of environmental storytelling. What did they find in that mine? That was the Umbral event. That is when Umbral started coming up. So yes, Chazar speaks of how these mines were important to the nation, but that something was speaking from the bowels of the earth. Chazar asks the question, is it a deer that speaks from the earth? And this would make sense to the people of Mornstead given that a deer's hand apparently comes from the earth. We of course know the answer, that it is more the putrid mother that speaks from the earth, but it's a nice detail that Chazar mentions this because I'm sure the people of Mornstead wondered if this was a deer's influence. Indeed, we do find a shrine in the cistern, as if it is placed here to be closer to a deer's presence. Chizar also speaks of an umbral event that caused umbral to spread upwards into Mornstead, and my assumption is that Chizar is speaking of the miners digging too deep and coming upon revelation depths, and from this, umbral spread like a virus. To me, this could have been some release of energy that filled the mines with poison, and led to the various collapses that we witnessed through umbral memories. Whatever the truth, we know that the miners were very much affected by the proximity to Umbral here, as the Sunless Skeen key reads, a key to a door connecting Lower Calrith to the Sunless Skeen. The Sunless Skeen overseer's treatment of the miners grew increasingly cruel over time, and although some miners sought to defend themselves, ultimately there was no defence against the madness which crept into both the overseer's mind and their own. This is clearly the effect of Umbral whispering to them, and there is an umbral memory in Calrath that seems to show one of these overseers talking to his wife about hearing things while he was down in the mines. I can't go back down there. I just can't. It's not the darkness or the hazards. It's the things the darkness shows you, whispers to you. I close my eyes at night and every time it's like I'm back down in the mine, like I'm trapped and I'll never escape and I can't breathe and there's, there's something looming over me over the whole world. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Indeed, Revelation Depths are unique in the fact that it contains the game's only umbral afflicted enemies that appear in Axiom, and this includes Winterberry and her umbral sparrow kin. Now, these particular sparrows, the ones that are found in Revelation Depths, are clearly the same model as the enemy type that we face in umbral in other areas. However, there is an important difference. The ones that we face in Revelation Depths that can attack us in Axiom actually have a soul if you soul flay them. There are some minor cosmetic differences as well, and there is a cavern full of their eggs, leading us to conclude that Winterberry and her kin aren't umbral beings who have crossed over the veil, rather they are a new life form, presumably formed from umbral tainted humans over generations to the point where they have their own reproductive cycle and are essentially a new species. Their location in the most umbral adjacent area in the game, and their similarity to an umbral manifestation, reinforce the idea that these beings are actual flesh and blood living creatures. 
but very much one that has been afflicted by the umbral taint. Indeed, this is reinforced by Byron, who refers to Winterberry as an umbral afflicted girl. But the fact we have a true living being that is connected to Umbral is very fascinating, and it really reinforces the point that the Revelation Depths are really where Umbral is most concentrated in Axiom. But of course, we cannot talk about Revelation Depths without talking about the boss that we face in this area, Harrowad Darvala and the Unbroken Promise, one of the most Umbral related bosses in the entire game. We find Harrowad Darvala protecting a young boy who seems to be pinned to the shrine within the temple of Mother's Lull. And it's a curious picture and we don't really know how the Harrower ends up down here. We know that she is part of the Dark Crusaders. In the story trailer, we do see her alongside Exactor Dunmire and Paladin Isaac before they are dispatched by the head of the Orion Church to Mornstead. But how did she come to end up in the bottom of these mines, guarding an umbral afflicted boy? Well, Exactor Dunmire does tell us of her betrayal, as he says, Two fellow crusaders accompanied me to Mornstead. One, a paladin who sacrificed himself to facilitate your resurrection. The other, a harrower who revealed herself to be an apostate and thief when she stole the apparatus with which I am able to converse with the Council of Overseers. An apparatus I would see returned to me by your hands. Harroward Dervla can be found in the tenebrous bowels of the mine, a fitting place for one who has turned her back on Aureus Light. Thankfully, the head of Hexworks, Sol Gascon, was kind enough to directly relay some of the high-level lore regarding this character. Sol told me that Dervla was a Dark Crusader who was recruited in her youth, but had recently been harbouring doubts regarding her mission and the church as a whole, and thus by the time she came to Mornstead, her faith was flagging. Sol then said the following of how this warrior came to be in the mines in particular. After a fierce battle at the mine district in Upper Calrath against Adir's forces, the pledged knight became gravely wounded and separated from Isaac who fled with Dunmire to protect him, while she was holding back the attack. Taking refuge in the sunless skein, wounded, she fled from her pursuers, going deeper and deeper into the mines, until she found an outpost of the Hallowed Sentinels who attended her wounds and helped her recover. After inquiring about the motivation of their presence down there, and insisting they should join the fight against the deer at the surface level, it was revealed to her that their mission was of the utmost importance. They were in charge of protecting a bulwark against Umbral to prevent its spread. When she realised that the catalyst was a little boy, she tried to free him, but she soon learned that he would die if removed from his imprisonment. So Darvla was wounded and ended up at a hallowed sentinel base in the mines, and this is clearly the mini fort that we can find partway down Revelation Depths, and it was here she learned of the young boy that was being used as a bulwark against Umbral. It seems as though this wasn't exactly a secret among the higher ups of the hallowed sentinels, as Pieta herself admits to knowing about this child. I understand the instinct to pity the boy found at the base of the mine and the desire to condemn the hallowed sentinels for placing him there. But don't be hasty. Unfortunate as it may be, the bond between the boy and Umbral is indissoluble, and his role in safeguarding Mornstead against the darkness is vital. After all, it's an undeniable fact of life that there can be virtue in suffering. And it becomes clear the reason the boy was chosen for this duty was because of his innate connection to Umbral. As the spell Martyrdom reads, The boy had always been troubled by dreadful dreams and unsettling visions, but it was only after he was condemned by the Hallowed Sentinels to serve as a bulwark against Umbral that he comprehended the power which had lain dormant inside of him all along, and whence it came. Saul gave me some background on this character as well, that he came from a distant land and it was his religious fanatic parents who brought him here to the Hallowed Sentinels, hoping to find a cure for his condition. Instead, the Hallowed Sentinels killed his parents and strapped him up as a bulwark against Umbral. So this all lines up neatly with what we've said about the Nahuta. We know that the Hallowed Sentinels had already massacred this Umbral worshipping race, and again, I really speculate that this temple was built by the Nahuta, especially when we see a memory of Molhu in this temple later when we talk about Elaine the Starved. And thus, since wiping out the Nahuta, 
they kept a close eye on this area of umbral resonance. And now finding this boy, they had a chance to seal it up for good to stop the spread of its influence. And so Darvla, already feeling some doubts about her religion and purpose, felt great remorse for the treatment of this boy, and so she promised to stay with him. And Saul told me that it was at this stage that the Hallowed Sentinels launched attacks on her, trying to dislodge her from this position, only for her to defeat them. And after they realised that she wouldn't cause any harm to the Bulwark, they just left her be. As long as she wasn't disturbed, she wasn't doing any harm. And this is the scene that we see in the remembrance of Dervla, the Umbral Stigma, where she is fighting two sacred resonances. This is why stage two of the fight is called the Unbroken Promise. Dervla promised to stay by the boy forever. And when Dervla is killed by us, the boy resurrects Dervla's body and melds with it. Now it truly is the Unbroken Promise because she will now not die until he does, as they are one. As you will learn as we go further into this video, where Umbral is present, death and horror does follow. But the treatment of this boy is a horrifying story, and it really does show the cruelty of the Hallowed Sentinels, especially to those that they deem heretical. But Mornstead itself has been long affected by Umbral in other ways, and some of the coolest lore that Cesar Vertuzzo shared with me was regarding Skyrest Bridge, the central hub area of Lords of the Fallen. So for those unaware, this is actually a bridge mausoleum where the royals of Mornstead are buried. We can even witness an umbral stigma of King Bramus visiting the grave of his mother. But why are they buried in a bridge? Why not a regular mausoleum? Well, Chizar explained that to me as well, and it is because of umbral. And I quote him now. I would much rather be a sculptor of the King Rest mausoleum where the Mornstead kings were believed to be cursed, if they were put in the ground, they would return as revenants. They didn't know about the umbral infection, so they entombed their bodies in the bridge and not in the ground. So we talked about the hushed saint rising from the dead because of umbral, and it seems as though this would be a common issue in Mornstead because of this umbral infection. No one really understood that it was the cosmic power of umbral that was causing this. Instead, they saw it as a curse thus to prevent their royals from suffering an ignoble fate of rising from the dead, they came up with the perfect solution. Bury them in a bridge, so that they are not buried touching the ground, they are in fact buried over the open sky. I think this is a really nice touch, and it shows how central Umbral has been to the history of Mornstead, even if people aren't aware of how central it is. But we talked about the Forsaken Fen, an area very affected by Umbral, but another area that has been utterly devastated by Umbral is the Fief of the Chill Curse, also known as King Rangar. King Rangar is a vassal fief to Mornstead, a fact we learn from the Black Feather set that tells us that the fief is under the protection of the Mornstead military, and it is also evidenced by the banners of the fief itself found on the walls, which show the King Rangar raven underneath the closed eye of Mornstead. It is clear that the crow is the symbol of these people, as evidenced by their black feather rangers and their banners, and we will understand the relevance of this later on. King Rangar is basically a community of Udringar refugees who fled from that original homeland and were offered asylum in Mornstead, something told to us by the accursed wretch trousers which read, An old ragged pair of trousers barely fit for purpose when a deranged tyrant waged a ruthless war across Udringer. A group of Udringrands fled across the sea in search of a new home, one eventually offered to them by Queen Verena II of Mornstead. York was the latest ruler of these people, and a close confidant to King Bramis, as we can see by an umbral memory of the two, speaking quite casually. And the King Rangar's leader's axe tells us a little more about this culture and its leaders. And it reads the following. An axe once carried by York, as well as previous leaders of King Rangar before him. While fairly simple in design, this axe held great symbolic significance to the people of King Rangar, as the weapon was handed down to each new leader of the fief upon their inauguration. So with the King Rangar warriors, Blackfeather rangers, and a good relationship between York and Bramis, they may well have seemed like a safe pair of hands to look after one of the beacons. But as we can see when we arrive in the fief, things are not great here. Umbral feeds off great emotion, and King Rangar has fallen to one emotion in particular, grief. 
we learn of a tragic event that rocked York via the Mask of the Drowned, which reads, a mask bearing the ruined visage of a young girl. The fish had already began to feed on Lucy's corpse by the time it was found and dragged from the water, and those others present could only abide the dreadful cry which erupted from York's throat as he looked down into the girl's face. Lucy is York's niece, but he essentially adopted her as his child, something we learn from York's ring. And it is clear that her death was something that absolutely rocked him and he was not willing to accept it, and thus he turned to some drastic solutions. This is something we learn of via the Hollow Crow's Remembrance, which reads, Unable to accept how he failed Lucy, York tampered with the primal magic of Udringar, almost entirely forgotten by his people after generations in Mornstead, but what returned to York was not his niece but a mockery of life, and so his eyes turned to one final, even more desperate gamble. So York calling on the primal magics of his people is the scene that we witness between York and a practitioner of this magic via an umbral stigma. My lord, I say once more, if you'd heed my skills, then also you should heed my warning. Can you do it or not? I know enough to try, but I've made clear the risks, both in the casting of the magic itself and what might be the results. Bring her back. The mage warns York of what the results could be, but York tells her to go ahead anyway, and yeah, it doesn't go well. The Remembrance suggests that this was a two-part ritual, where after bringing Lucy back and realising that she was essentially not a human anymore, he pushed for a more desperate gamble, and I believe this is what we see in the Umbral Stigma found in the Hollow Crow's boss room, where we see York carrying his niece's body, surrounded by crows and his people, clearly on his way to do a ritual. You will note that York appears to be heading in the direction of the beacon in this umbral stigma. Indeed, his King Rangar leader's axe can actually be found on this pathway, suggesting this is the last walk he ever took. And there is a reason that he is heading towards the beacon in this last umbral stigma, the umbral stigma of the Hollow Crow. It's because the beacon seems to be the focus of his last desperate gamble. The description for the Fief map implies that the cataclysm that destroyed this area originated from the beacon. I would therefore suggest that York tried to amplify the effects of his resurrection ritual with the power of the beacon, but this backfired with terrible consequences. And yes, this is why the crow seems to be the symbol of King Rangar, as crows seem to be drawn to this primal magic of Udringar. Now, the details of these rituals are not entirely clear to us, and even York's people seem to have mainly forgotten the details of it having long been away from their homeland. But what is clear to us is that these primal magics are of umbral origin. As we've discussed numerous times throughout this video, the only power that seems to be able to bring people back from the death in a form is umbral magic. And this is made even more clear to us when we see the form that Lucy now takes. She is a sort of umbral wisp, a disembodied soul, a hollow reflection of the girl that once was, but very much umbral in nature, again reinforcing the fact that this ritual, whatever its source, was an umbral spell cast to try and bring Lucy back. However, Lucy is not alone. We also see this huge monstrosity, the Hollow Crow. Now, we do have to speculate how this being came to pass, but this Hollow Crow is clearly York. It says Lucy's name as Lucy the Wisp departs from its body, as if a father talking to his daughter. Not only this, but the remembrance that comes from the Hollow Crow is the thing we quoted earlier that talks mainly about York, again reinforcing the idea that this monstrosity is what remains of York. Somehow York combined with crows, perhaps this was an element of the primal magic of Udringar that just didn't go right. My speculation is that he acts as an axiom anchor to what is left of the umbral wisp that is Lucy, and that his last desperate gamble was an attempt to let Lucy live on through his body, summoning her umbral spirit into his body, but it didn't quite work that way, and instead we now have this absolute beast, this umbral crow, 
that has the remnants of Lucy within his heart, the Hollow Crow. This event also wiped out King Ringar as a whole, as the description for the map of the Frozen Thief reads the following. Tacitus' notes and sketches relating to the Thief of King Rangar, unnaturally frozen in a cataclysmic incident, involving the region's hallowed sentinel beacon. The drawings include a concerningly large nest and the suggestion of something to be found under the surface of King Rangar's waters. So this is really interesting. So it suggests that the creation of the Hollow Crow somehow ties to the beacon, and I would suggest that they tried to do their final ritual using the power of the beacon as an energy source. And as such, there was a big cataclysmic explosion, and King Rangar was subjected to a cataclysmic flash freeze, essentially. The armour description of the King Rangar Guardians makes it clear that the citizens were suddenly and without warning engulfed by a wall of ice. Again, if you had any doubt that this was an umbral cataclysm, we have to remember that the ice is very much an element of umbral, and ultimately the result of this cataclysm was the umbral creature known as the Hollow Crow. The dress of the Griefbound, the frozen spellcasters found in this region, read the following. A long dress, now little more than tatters. These pitiable souls of King Rangar remain trapped in their bitter embrace of their unending grief, unaware that it was the grief of another which led to their fate. So much like in the case of the Forsaken Fen, a society tampering with umbral forces led to the destruction of their people, but a cataclysm of ice instead of poison. Umbral had plenty to feed upon here, grief and many deaths, and it's why again it's one of the most umbral infested areas of the game, umbral focusing on this area like moths to a flame around all the death and emotions that happened here. And this is why we can find imprints of the Hollow Crow throughout Umbral. It is reflecting what it saw in Axiom. While the Nohuta were obliterated, Molhu remained the last of his kind, something told to us by the description of the Umbral Lamp, which reads, A lamp crafted by Molhu, last of the Nohuta, contains a strange and ravenous light which allows its chosen bearer not only to enter and manipulate Umbral, the hidden realm beyond Axiom, but even resurrect upon death. For me, it is clear that following the fall of his people, Molhu was still loyal to the Putrid Mother and wanted to carry on her mission, and thus he looked for more surreptitious means to spread her influence, and the lamps were clearly one way of doing this. The description of the Helvet Rune tells us how these artifacts benefit Umbral. It reads, the umbral lamps are objects with powerful connections to both life and death, granting immortality to their bearers, while simultaneously contributing to the endless tide of corpses which flow into umbral. It is a lamp that comes with huge benefits, and this is why so many mortals gladly pick one up, for varying reasons. Byron's Katrin died at the hands of the Hallowed Sentinel's torture, and she and Byron would not have had the extra time they had if not for the Umbral Lamp, which is why Byron now tends to the vestiges. He is grateful, although afraid of Umbral. Lorello the Cursed Knight was cursed by a terrible affliction and hoped that the Umbral Lamp would provide him respite or a cure, and thus he took a lamp. Each of the fallen lamp bearers took the lamp for their own reasons, and each thought it was a tool benefiting them, but in the end they were tools for Umbral, feeding the hungry realm with death and souls. Coming to Mornstead and assessing the situation, Dunmire was shocked at how far gone the kingdom was, and how close Adir was to returning. Dunmire came here with two associates, the Paladin Isaac and Dervla the Knight that we face in Revelation Depths. We can see this mission being given to the three in the story cinematic, where they kneel before the head of the Orion Church. I will cover the Orion Faith and the Dark Crusaders more deeply in a later video, but they are from a distant land and have essentially fallen out with Judge Cleric and her hallowed sentinels even before the events of the game. I imagine Vanguard Barros, whose body we can find in the Forsaken Fen, preceded the arrival of these three and sent intelligence back to the Orion Church, as the Exactor does describe that this is the role of vanguards within the Dark Crusade. Sol Gascon confirmed to me that upon arriving in Mornstead, Dunmire determined that the Umbral Lamp was the best course of action necessary to undo the corruption, and he is correct. As we have discussed, the Umbral Lamp and the power of Umbral in general has the power to consume anything, even the corruption of another god. 
and thus he gave the tool to Paladin Isaac, who became the newest lamp bearer. Isaac harboured doubts about using this tool given that it was deemed heretical by the majority of the Orion faith. Swinging my soul with such a heretical burden, I cannot help but feel like this path only leads me, leads all of us, further from Aureus's light, not closer to it. Exactor, there must be some other way. So you deem my guidance injudicious? No. However, he was spurred on by Exactor Dunmire, who told him that this tool was necessary even if it was heretical. But this is ultimately a gamble, for all it would take is one user of the lamp to go the umbral path and everything would fall to ruin, which is essentially what happens when you choose the umbral ending. This is why when Paladin Isaac realises that he is not suited to this mission and throws away the lamp, and we get it, Exactor Dunmire is there straight away, trying to indoctrinate us into his program, to make us a Dark Crusader before we have time to think, for ourselves, what we'd want to do with this lamp. Because Dunmire knows two things, this lamp is critical for his plans, and that if we became a rogue lamp bearer, the consequences could be massive, as in the case of the Umbral ending where it's literally world ending. Indeed, even a deer recognises the threat that these lamp pose. After all, we can use this lamp to devour a deer himself, at the end, so he better recognise the threat. And so, he creates a specialised tool for the job, a tool that will fight fire with fire, the Light Reaper, whose genesis we learn about via its parasite, which reads, Recognising the threat represented by the Lamp Bearer mission, Adir was able to obtain one of the Umbral Parasites and bind it to a Rogar, creating the Light Reaper, a creature unaware of the suspicion and distrust with which he would always be regarded by his creator. Just as an aside, it seems that Adir created this in general in response to lamp bearers, not for when the Dark Crusaders first picked up umbral lamps, because we do see memories of him fighting other lamp bearers that aren't associated with the Dark Crusaders, like Lorello, who we can see a memory of him fighting in the abandoned Red Cops, and Katrin, who we can see him fighting in the Forsaken Fen. And this does make sense, because while the Dark Crusaders are specifically targeting Adir and his corruption, in general if an Umbral Lamp Bearer was successful in helping the Putrid Mother come to power, then everything would end anyway, and so it's likely that he created the Light Reaper at the point when Lamp Bearers became more prominent, probably when Molhu started handing them out like candy. So this Rogar Lord was created by fusing an Umbral Parasite with Rogar Flesh, and Molhu tells us that the Light Reaper was his fault, implying that it was a parasite stolen from his possession. The appropriated offspring is returned to the care of this unworthy servant. My abiding failure only redressed by you, but no more weeping, no. Instead, joy at finally bearing witness to the makings of an umbral paragon. One blooming as umbral itself will soon bloom upon this base reality. The parasite within the Light Reaper essentially turned him into a bloodhound for lamp bearers, and this is something we learn about via his armour set which reads, Helm of the fearsome Rogar, known as the Light Reaper, hunter of lamp bearers. Existing only to carry out the will of their creator, no Rogar has ever truly known peace, but only the Light Reaper feels the inescapable gnawing hunger which would compel him to seek out lamp bearers, even if he did not do so at Adir's command. In dialogues with Adir, whether it be at his effigy or when we are fighting him, he has no great regard for the putrid mother, calling her a vile creature, and so it makes sense that he would view his own creation that is tainted by her magic as something repulsive, a being that is driven by the hunger of Umbral and not a deer's will, though it does serve his purposes nonetheless, and ultimately he is the one that drives Isaac to give up on his mission. So he is an effective creation, and indeed the weapons of the Light Reaper do explain further how the Light Reaper eventually beats down Umbral lamp bears despite the fact they are immortal, as his dagger reads, a dagger once carried by the Light Reaper. Many lamp bearers believed that their determination combined with the resurrective power of the Umbral Lamp would allow them to outlast the ruthless hounding of the Light Reaper, but every fresh death 
and resultant awakening in Umbral take their toll, while the Light Reaper never wanes in the hunt. So he basically just wore them down, and who knows how many lamp bearers besides Isaac he was responsible for the death of, Catrin perhaps, or maybe even Lorello. We know that lamp bearers, despite being immortal, do eventually fall, and it's likely tied to one's mental state, the will to carry on. For example, the Iron Wayfarer, Harkin, has lasted hundreds of years as a lamp bearer because he is strong of will. One of the most interesting umbral stigmas of the Light Reaper is him actually fighting the Hollow Crow, presumably drawn to its presence because of its umbral energies, as he's essentially a bloodhound for umbral power. I've always found the Light Reaper's death animation to be very interesting, as his dragon mount seems to dive bomb him and kill him. And this is my interpretation of what happens. We know that the Light Reaper's mount can go in and out of portals, presumably to Adir's realm, the Rogar realm that we go to in the first game. And at this stage, the Light Reaper knows he's beaten and calls his mount to help take him away to escape. But Adir, disgusted by his servant and now seeing that he has failed, essentially commands the dragon to finish off the Light Reaper. That's just my interpretation. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. But talking about parasites, we do of course need to talk about the star of the show when it comes to Umbral, Elaine the Starved. Now, working out what happens at the Umbral ending is a little difficult given we don't really see what happens, but let's do our best to speculate. It all clearly revolves around parasites, the three that we gather from Harkin, Light Reaper, and Elaine. And as I stated earlier, my belief is that the Putrid Mother tries to bridge the gap between the two realms by increasing her presence and power in Axiom. Thus, parasites that feed off powerful life forms are a way in which she can achieve this, and by placing these powered up umbral beings into the pillars, we can create a sort of gateway between Axiom and Umbral, allowing the Putrid Mother to descend upon the real world. While the Light Reaper was a mistake of Mulhu's, Harkin seems to be a sort of happy accident. For those who don't know, Harkin is the name of the Iron Wayfarer, and he has lived an awfully long time. Harkin is the player character from the first game, and while Andreas of Eeb claims that his ancestor Antanas was a hero who was killed by a common criminal, Harkin, the truth is far different. Yes, Harkin was a criminal, but one who had the strength necessary to prevent Adir's return a thousand years ago. He was the only one able to match the Rogar in his capacity for violence. It was Antanas' desire to become a god that led him to mutilate and warp his body into the new Judge, and thus Harkin had to put down the monster. This all happened a thousand years ago, according to the devs, and thus Harkin's long life can only be down to one thing, an umbral lamp. It is therefore not surprising that over his long tenure as a lamp bearer and a warrior, he has had a parasite growing within him. His parasite reads the following. Harkin had lived longer than any man was meant to, and in that time committed acts of both great good and appalling evil. And although the latter typically retained greater clarity and significance, time and the fickle nature of memory would bury some of his worst crimes deep within his mind forgotten. It is interesting to note that the umbral parasites can only form in beings that exist in both umbral and axiom, exploitable bridges themselves. Elaine is part human and part umbral, Harkin is a lamp bearer, thus someone who has lived in Umbral but is a living being, and the Light Reaper is part Rogar, part Umbral. And thus we can see another benefit to Mulhu passing out Umbral lamps, as it is born fruit in the form of Harkin. This brings us neatly to Elaine, a creation of Mulhu, an attempt to grow a powerful Umbral parasite. And this is something we learn via Elaine's armor set, which reads the following. Molhu suffered many failures before a mother and baby finally survived his process, and the latter, a girl, was born with an umbral parasite bonded to her very essence. The mother being no further use, Molhu disposed of her, before going on to watch over the child with the greatest of care and interest. So Molhu was clearly trying for years to create a being that would serve as the perfect host for a parasite, and in the end created Elaine, an Axiom human with a parasite bonded to the part of her fairy essence. We witness this moment of triumph in a stigma after our fight with Elaine found in Mother's Lull Temple. Ages of disappointment and shame, but finally now, 
In you, my efforts rewarded and her will achieved. Oh, precious Elian. Again, the fact that Molhu is in here, celebrating his success in creating Elaine, does reinforce what I've been saying, that this temple found in Revelation Depths is likely of Nuhuta origins. We can see that Elaine is an infant in Molhu's arms during this memory, and presumably at some stage he made sure that she made it to the orphanage in Calrath. We witness an umbral stigma of Pieta in Calrath when she was an orphan. From this memory we receive a stone, and if we hand it to Pieta she tells us about her time as an orphan. That stone, it looks different somehow, but I know it. When I was a girl at the orphanage, there was a very kind woman, Iris. She gave it to me. This was before the Hallowed Sentinels found me. I felt so afraid and alone, but Iris helped me overcome my fears. I lost the stone long ago, but now here it is again, all these years later. I wish I could say the same at the orphanage. And Iris? Now, the name Iris is a little on the nose, don't you think? Given the relevance of eyes to the putrid mother and Umbral. And the full secret description of the Odd Stone even has a connection to Umbral, because it talks about Mornstead's relation to Umbral. Remember, Elaine's armour set suggests that Molhu kept a close eye on her. Perhaps this Iris is a spy of his, or is him in another form, but that's just speculation. However, at some stage Pieta would be taken in by the Hallowed Sentinels, probably because of her unique powers. She would become one of theirs, and we have already discussed this, but she mainly grew up in the Abbey, considering it her true home. Pieta is clearly special, the powers that she displays are unmatched by any other Hallowed Sentinel, and the Hallowed Sentinels took her powers as a sign of her holiness, and she became special to them. Pieta's helm reads, Helm of Pieta, she of blessed renewal. As the young Pieta's powers blossomed even more brilliantly than the Hallowed Sentinels expected, they shared with her the tale of her miraculous origin, being born of a human mother impregnated with holy light bestowed by Aureus himself, hence her extraordinary nature. Again, I think this lore is all a great touch. To the Sentinels and even Pieta herself, Pieta's powers are something holy and blessed, and she is almost like the Immaculate Conception. However, we know the truth. She is a being of Umbral, created by a horrific experiment by an Umbral worshipper. Pieta's armour description tells us that the sight of her wings on the battlefield gave heart to other hallowed sentinels, when in fact we know these aren't angelic wings of a divine being, these are the raven-like wings of an Umbral parasite. We use an item called the Sanguinarix to heal ourselves, and the item description tells us specifically that this was an object used to administer Pieta's healing blood. The Hallowed Sentinels used Umbral Tainted Blood because they thought it was a holy medium, when in reality the liquid they were all poisoning and healing themselves with was Umbral in origin, if only they knew the truth. Pieta can resurrect because she is an Umbral being. Again, as we've discussed many times, the only things that can come back from death appear to be those touched by Umbral, including ourselves. And that should have been a clue right at the beginning of the game that Pieta was something umbral when she came back to life after our boss fight, but you'd only pick up on it after you've done the umbral path. That being said, her time as a hallowed sentinel was not entirely wasted. She can pass powerful Orion magics. Even when we face her as Elaine, she still mixes in her Orion magic, and no doubt it was from the sentinels that she learned her swordcraft. But this long denial is why she is called Elaine the Starved, since she is never once fed in the sense of her umbral side. Thus, when we soul flay her and pull out her true form, she no doubt felt an overwhelming starvation, a never-ending hunger that only an umbral being can feel. Elaine's story is very sad. Pieta, a persona which she no doubt felt some satisfaction from, is just a lie for her true self, a beautiful facade that we roughly rip away in a single moment with a brutal soul flay. Everything she was through her whole life, everything she achieved, is replaced with an unnatural hunger. She becomes little more 
than an umbral parasite. And really, Pieta's true purpose was just to feed a parasite that we take from her corpse. Yet of course we can choose not to follow this path and allow Pieta to live in blissful ignorance. But some things are inevitable. Elaine's armour reads the following. The girl the hallowed sentinels renamed Pieta never realised that by serving a cause she deemed greater than herself and giving life, she was acting in defiance of her own parasitic nature. But sooner or later, somehow, hunger will out. So thanks guys, that is my take on Umbral and the Umbral denizens and the putrid mother at the centre of it all. This was a massive subject and a massive undertaking and there are certainly some areas that I could have touched on more but I feel I handled the main points. I would like to talk more about Harkin, a character I really love, but I will discuss his story more in an Adir video. But let me know your thoughts on this subject. Do you disagree or agree with my assessment of Umbral? But until next time guys, please like and subscribe to the channel as I will be doing more lore videos to follow. And aside from that, I hope you just have a nice December and a happy holiday season. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.